Good morning again to you live from Atlanta, Coke headquarters, where I am joined by James Quincy, the CEO of Coca-Cola, soon to be chairman in April. Congratulations on that announcement. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get to that in a moment, but let's pick up where they left off, this crazy market volatility. Stocks are up today, but it has been a wild ride. What, what's your take on the market jolts we're feeling? Yeah, I think um, I, like everyone else, uh, I'm a little confused. Is, is it the return to the normal of uh, a normal level of volatility? Or is it a sign of the uncertain moment that we're at as to what is the direction of travel geopolitically and economically going into 2019? Um, you can find any forecast you like out there. So I think what it's really a sign of is the degree of uncertainty that everyone has. Um, but what we have to do as a company is focus on what we can control. We've got a great strategy. We've got a game plan. We've got to execute it. Um, and we will see our way through what I think will be a very interesting 2019. I know that's the message you're here to tell, but you also have a pretty good view into consumer spending. Have conditions deteriorated in the U.S. in the last few months since we spoke? Uh, I think you saw coming out of the summer, it, it, became, a little, it became a little softer as it got into September. Um, um, and so we did see a little, we did see a little decline in, in, in September. Obviously, we took some price increases at the beginning of the summer. So some of that wasn't entirely unexpected, uh, given, given the process of some of the inflationary cost of goods and freight that's happened in the U.S. market. So I think some of that was to be expected. Uh, of course, we'll see how that passes through the system. Often you get a reaction in the short term. Um, but I think that the moment is uncertain, even here in the U.S. As you look forward, into consumer spending and the U.S. economy. What do you see in 2019? I, I th again, 2019, I think, is uncertain. Um, you know, you've got lots of forecasts out there, whether it's the U.S. or globally, saying there's going to be growth next year. Maybe not as much as 20, 2018, um, a little bit slower, but still growth. Mm -hmm. Still growth in U.S., still growth in the global economy. Um, so we think the consumers are going to have the money, uh, and so we're, we're bullish on our plan. Amid all the market volatility, your stock has actually done very well. It's a defensive play, up 7% in the last three months, overall market down 8% in that environment. But you're also outperforming some of the other staples. What do you chuck the, the outperformance up to? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we've done, we've had a good 2018. I think what people are starting to see is our growth story coming to life. We've now got uh, five quarters in a row where we've had our top line in the range that we're looking for in the long term with some good operating leverage turning into, into profits and turning into U.S. dollar earnings. Uh, so I think people are starting to see that we're getting traction, coming off the refranchising, the selling of our bottlers, coming off the reinvestment in sparkling. And as we lean forward into a broader uh, portfolio, we're starting to get the growth that people want us to start driving. And I think that's coming through in the stock. How do you keep the momentum going? Wall Street is also a big fan of the total beverage strategy, some of the deals you've done. What are you telling them to keep them excited about all that? Uh, I think we know we, we're talking about our discipline of building out the portfolio. I mean, consumer brands are not created overnight. They, they tend to take some gestation period of time to come around. Uh, we've got to have a disciplined approach to building that portfolio around the world. If we stay consumer centric and work to create value for the retailers and the customers we sell to, uh, we can continue to make this story happen into the future and incorporate some of these bold-on acquisitions that we've made. You get full control in April. You've been CEO <laughs> over the last year, but taking over as chairman, what's that going to allow you to do that you haven't been able to? Uh, I, I think that it's, it's a process of transition. I mean, as CEO, you run the company. Uh, obviously, it's a great honor to be nominated as the chair by, by the board um, uh, for April. Um, but in the end, this is about taking the foundation that's been created over 130 years uh, and building the next growth chapter. Um, we've got a great board. Um, obviously, I'll be there as chair. We've got a new uh, um, lead independent director, Mel, uh, our first female lead independent director, uh, with the rest of the board and the management team. But our focus is on the next chapter of growth. Everything that's come before is the foundation to allow us to build going forward. And on that end, I mean, deal making has been very busy. Uh, busiest, I think, 2018, six deals. Didn't see that in, from Coke in the last few years. Part of the Wall Street bullish thesis, and there are a number of notes out this morning reiterating that thesis, is that the pace continues to ramp. Is that what's going to happen? Um, I, I think pace of deal making is a very lumpy uh, proposition. You know, no one quarter or year is projectable into the future because it's about, you know, not just is the strategy right, 
but the financials add up and is the opportunity there to invest in the brands, the brands you love. We're focused on building out the portfolio. We had some good investments in 2018. We're excited about their prospects in 2019 and beyond. What we're focused on is putting the pieces in place so that we build out the portfolio. But don't expect that pace to continue. Is that no, don't, that, that, pace is, that pace is unlikely to continue at that rhythm in 2019. Of course, partly we've got to absorb the ones that we've invested in in 2018. Um, but just experience would tell you uh, that they just don't come up uh, at that sort of rhythm uh, the whole time. We need to focus on uh, also bringing them to life as well. Well, one of the biggest and flashiest has been Costa Coffee, which is set to close soon. When and where are we going to see Costa in the U.S.? <laughs> Actually, our focus, for, I mean, firstly, we need to close the deal. That's, that's the first thing that needs to occur. Um, and then we've got some ideas on what the expansion uh, should mm -hmm. be for Costa. Um, remembering that we've, we've, we've taken this on board because we actually see the multiple formats of Costa as the way it will play and fit into the Coke system. Yes, there are some stores that build experience, um, but the, the way that they have uh, developed the business to be able to be within someone else's business, combined with our huge strength as being a cold beverage partner, we can now be a hot beverage partner as well, uh, that's going to allow us to really offer uh, the retailers and the, our customers uh, are a much more effective solution for everything. But it also need. means you're in the restaurant business, which I know you've gotten a lot of questions about. It, it's a departure for Coca-Cola. Has it changed your relationship with McDonald's, your biggest food service customer? Look, it, it, it clearly it has. Your competitor now. It, it has it has some coffee stores. Uh, we got a lot of we got a lot of customers out there. Some of them have asked questions about how that works. But our focus is a, is a coffee strategy, not trying to be the a big retailer in the world. We're trying to. Take the cost of vending machine as an example. This is, in a way, the hot version of our freestyle machine. Our freestyle machine, normally you have six or eight valves on a fountain gun. This can do over 100 beverages. Costa is the latest <coughs> upgrade to cappuccino or barista style coffee. This is something that we think can pair fantastically with the business system that really we have that exists today uh, and can help drive a hot and cold solution uh, for many retailers out there. So coffee's growing as, as you look toward more categories. So is CBD. And your answers have sort of, you, you've, it sounds like you're trying to play it cool and cautious when it comes to development of potentially CBD beverages. Well, why is that? There's so much growth there and may not be legal fully in this country, but it is. The rules are changing. Yeah, look, we, we have an approach on all, on all ingredients, including, including CBD. And, um, uh, and, and the way I've expressed it is, hey, look, it needs to be legal. It needs to be safe. It is in Canada. <laughs> and it needs to be consumable. Well, it's not yet legal in Canada, but the one day in 2019 it will be in Canada. It needs to be safe. Consensus science is not out there. Um, for us, as a large consumer prompt, company, consumers expect us to be on the safest end uh, of ingredient science. So legal is one question. Consensus science that's robustly behind safety is, is necessary for us, but it also needs to be consumable. There are things that you can take once in a while, a couple of times for a few days, but then you should stop. We want our beverages to be consumable every day, so we, it needs to be safety seen it's through the... It's not there yet. And it's not there yet. How much tougher is the macro environment right now making all of this for you, specifically foreign exchange? Uh, foreign exchange is a problem. Um, yeah, you know, we're, we're a 75% international company, uh, for, um, based in the U.S., but 75% of our business is, is international. Um, the, the currency environment had calmed off the back of 17 and coming into 18. Clearly in the third quarter for us, uh, it went much more negative. It was about 8% negative on our, on our earnings in the third quarter. Uh, I think, you know, what that's going to look like in 2019 it's very hard to say at this stage. I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, so we're going to focus on what we can control. Uh, but the currency will, will be an impact to us uh, one way or the other. Uh, at the moment, it's standing in the negative column. So would you join the chorus of those on Wall Street calling for the Fed to stop hiking interest rates so that the dollar slows down? Uh, I, think that, I think the Fed will uh, follow their mandate, which is to set the rates that make most sense for the U.S. economy. Um, also, having inflation take off isn't positive for a consumer business either. It will, it will eat in con into consumers' purchasing power. So I don't think it's going to be one of those things where one can just look at a single variable. Um, so I think the Fed will make the decision it makes. In the long run, the currency thing will play itself out. Uh, it's just for a company like us, it, it affects us in the short term. Brexit is also a factor here and a big source of anxiety in the market. What a mess. H how do you think this all plays out? Um, I don't have a crystal ball on Brexit. <laughs> I, I sort of, 
uh, suspect at the moment that uh, um, it's going to have to go to some sort of thing where they go back and, and ask the population what they really want. Uh, when you ask for a choice... You think you there's going to be another referendum? I don't know. I, I don't know whether it'll be a referendum. I, I, I personally think um, that having uh, kind of a single transferable vo vote between each of the different options, not just you want to stay or not want to stay, you've got to choose between something that's going to exist. You know, do you want in? If you want out, what sort of out do you want? If you could have a transferable vote between all those things, you'd end up with a, and eliminate the lowest vote answer, you'd end up with a, something that more than 50% of the population supports. Because the problem at the moment is everything, everyone can find something they don't like about everything that's on the table. Uh, and what we need to achieve is something where more than 50% of the people coalesce around it, and the rest of the population in the minority can live with it. I don't know whether that'll happen, um, but I think it's more likely than it was three weeks ago. Is the trade war impacting you at all? I know you have a lot of local production in China, but what about Coke as an American brand? Um, trade, war, trade war isn't a really a direct impact on, on us. As, as you say, you know, virtually everywhere you go in the world, 95% of what's sold in the country is made in the country. So we really, truly are uh, a local business in that sense. Um, trade wars tend to be an indirect impact to the extent they dampen the economy, dampen consumer purchasing power, it feeds through. It feeds through as an impact onto us, uh, and that's how it. That's how it affects us. So, in the end, we, we stand for better trade deals. Um, none of them are perfect. All of them can be made better, uh, and, and hopefully. Think they'll that's... be able to make a deal, the U.S. and China, in 90 days? I don't know. I hope so. Um, but when but I you don't see know. reports of iPhones being smashed in China, for instance, as a, as a source of national pride, doesn't that worry you about the big business that you built on the ground there? Yeah, I mean, clearly when, 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 uh, when these sorts of uh, uh, negotiations or disputes start to get very emotional, um, they can be picked up by, by elements uh, and used for other purposes. Um, but I think there are a lot of cool heads in, in governments around the world uh, trying to focus on making trade better, trying to focus on growing the economy. In the end, they're all in the business of delivering uh, a better quality of life and better economics for their populations. And finally, we're just this hour, we're watching Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, testify on the Hill, facing all sorts of scrutiny. You're, you're one of the biggest advertisers in the world. Do you pay attention to these hearings and the behavior and the scandals around companies like Google and Facebook when it comes to those advertising decisions? Yeah, abs absolutely. We're interested uh, not just in what advertising vehicles are effective, but the reputation that goes with them. Uh, and so we pay a lot of attention and, uh, and we provide that. Are you making any moves on that? Uh, we, we, we are constantly evaluating where we should spend our media money, both on the effectiveness and what it reflects on us as, as a user of those, those vehicles. Got it. James Quincy, thank you very much. Weighing in on a number of topics in the news and on the company and the transformation you're making. The CEO and incoming chairman of Coca-Cola here in Atlanta.